The T-90 is a third generation Russian main battle tank that entered service in 1993. At the end of the Cold War, the Soviets sought to develop a single tank type to replace its fleet of three existing types of main battle tanks, which were the mainstay of the Soviet forces. The T-72 platform was selected as the basis for the new tank due to its low cost, simplicity and mechanical attributes. There are two parallel proposals. The Object 188, which was a relatively simple upgrade of the existing T-72B tank and the far more advanced Object 187. Development work was approved in 1986 and the first prototypes were completed by 1988. The T-90 uses a 125mm smoothbore cannon as its main armament with an advanced fire control system and thermal sights. Standard protective measures include a blend of steel and composite armour, six smoke grenade discharges on either side of the turret, and the Contact 5 explosive reactive armour, and the Stora infrared anti-tank guided missile jamming system. An upgraded multi-fuel engine developing 830 horsepower was installed as the power plant. Less than 200 T-90 tanks were delivered to the Russian ground forces before production ground to a halt in the late 1990s. This was later resumed in 2005 of an upgraded version. Facing tapering domestic orders and with the permanent closure of the last turret casting line in the former USSR, a new welded turret was developed to offer further improvement and attract foreign buyers for the T-90. India immediately showed interest after the purchase of 320 Ukrainian T-84 tanks by Pakistan. With the Made in India policy, it had already held the rights to locally manufacture the T-72 and production was easily adapted to assemble the T-90. In the first order, which occurred in 2001, India purchased 310 T-90S tanks, of which 124 were delivered complete and the remaining 186 were to be assembled from kits which were delivered in various stages of completion. In 2005, the production lines were reopened in Russia for domestic orders. And as of 2016, Russia operates 550 T-90As. The current export model is the T-90S version, with numerous countries taking delivery with an estimated total of 3,200 units being produced by the end of 2017. The kit itself is a great example of a modern battle tank done well, with crisp detail and all the parts fitting perfectly. Other than a negligible amount of filler being used on the main gun, no other corrections were required. One point of note on this build is the amount of tiny brass pieces to cut and glue into place. With this you are looking at quite a few extra hours compared to a similar main battle tank. But the degree of extra detail, and especially at this price point, is great. Plenty for any wash to bite into and the final outcome is well worth the effort. The undercoat step in the painting process is one of the most important. I'm a big fan of black basing, especially when it comes to military vehicles. My current preference is Mr. Surfacer Black 1500 grade filler. When thinned with their leveling thinner to a 70 or 80% thinner mix, I find it produces a superb base. When spraying, make sure that you spray enough on the surface so that it's slightly wet, but not too much that it begins to pull. Build up two or three layers like this with a few minutes of drying time in between. This will not only create a solid shell, but also fills in any micro imperfections and reduces any tiny scratches. Ordinarily, the wheels and tracks should be sprayed separately, 
but for the purposes of filming, I opted to take a shortcut of spraying it fully assembled. However, off camera, I had to correct many areas that were missed. When spraying, be sure to do so from all angles, as often other parts will obscure certain areas. Once all the coats have been completed and allowed to dry for at least 24 hours, I opted to go ahead with the white pre-shading. In hindsight, however, I question whether the subtle differences that this creates can actually be seen, especially given the level of clutter compared to aircraft and the amount of other weathering used. I think if you're good at dry brushing, with the light and blend of the colours, you could achieve better results. In any event, should you wish to replicate the pre-shading, it is a simple matter of building up the white on any raised surface, thereby darkening the depressions. The strength of the contrast diminishes significantly after the base colours are painted. When applying a multicolored camo scheme such as this, where it's a mixture of very light and very dark colors, it's important to start with the light colors first. This is because if you overspray the light color outside of its zone, it won't affect the darker colors much or at all. My personal preference when painting camo schemes on larger scale models is to do a freehand. With a decent airbrush, it's so much easier than if you were to mask it all up first, especially on complex surfaces such as the defensive systems and other equipment. Again, as with the undercoat, make sure that all the angles are covered. This will require holding the model and rotating it in your hand, which for the purposes of filming was not done here, but off camera any spots that were missed were corrected. When applying the subsequent colours, such as the green scene here, particular attention should be paid to the exact boundaries, especially with respect to the lighter colour. Take your time and study the painting guide. A good rule of thumb is to first trace the outline of the patch that you're working on. This will allow you to focus on the paint build up rather than on the outlines when painting the rest. Make sure the pressure is set low and keep the airbrush relatively close to the model, about 2 centimeters or so. Try and keep the airbrush angle at about 80 degrees to the surface. Once the outlines are done, it's simply a matter of filling in the area in between, making sure that the paint coverage is consistent and even. Paint often is slightly darker when dry, so if in doubt, move on to another section and allow it to dry for a few minutes. Give the whole model a good close inspection especially underneath the raised armour plates and explosive reactive armour before moving on to the next colour. 
When painting freehand, you can occasionally go beyond where you intended or have some overspray. It's best practice to complete the whole painting process with each colour before tending to the touch-ups. Due to the filming setup, I ended up having to correct an unusually high amount. I really enjoy painting the final colour, as it just seems to come to life properly at this point. Perhaps it's the fact that with this, the painting comes to a close. A milestone that can be very satisfying. Take extra care if you ever have such contrasting colours, as mistakes will be difficult to fully rectify. As before, draw the outline and then fill it in. Prior to applying the wash, the whole model was sprayed with an enamel gloss varnish and then two coats of acrylic gloss varnish. I find applying the enamel gloss first bites into the enamel paintwork and subsequently lays a good foundation for the acrylic gloss coats as well as providing a small degree of extra protection. This is more important on vehicles due to the fact that it has areas where the ink will pull slightly and subsequently dry over a longer time. It probably wouldn't hurt to put down an extra layer of acrylic varnish. My personal preference is to use enamel ink washes. The reason is because they're thinner and they enhance the cracks and create a contrast that is easily controlled with layers. Try to apply the wash as sparingly as possible, but make sure that all the cracks and bolts are covered. It's quite okay if you do go out of the intended scope, as it can be easily cleaned up in the next stage. But the more careful you are now, the less risk of damage to the paint underneath should the varnish not fully coat everything adequately. When cleaning up the wash, Use a good quality cotton bud, dipped in enamel thinner, try not to over soak the bud, it should be sufficiently moist that the whole bud is wet and fully absorbed but not so that it holds excess liquid. If too much is absorbed, simply press it against a tissue and remove any excess. When wiping off the wash, use care so as to remove only what you want, as it is easy to wipe it all clean. Also, try and wipe using strokes perpendicular to the cracks. One issue that is ever present with this process, and with any subject, is the risk of physically rubbing off the protective acrylic varnishes. This is especially the case on raised surfaces, where the varnish is invariably the thinnest, as it tends to run down any vertical slope due to gravity. If this occurs, as can be seen here, then there are two options. One is to repaint the area, often a simple touch-up with a paintbrush if only a small area. Alternatively, if you are planning to add chipping at a later stage, you can use this process to cover up the defects. Naturally, only if they are in a spot that would ordinarily be exposed to weathering.
There are two main schools of thought when it comes to chipping and how far one should go. The first is the group that seek to replicate true realism, as one would see in the photos. And subtlety is king in this view. The other is a more artistic approach, which is more about enhancing the model so that it looks interesting from a distance, highlighting its features. I tend to sit somewhere in between, or possibly slightly on the artistic camp. If you feel that the chipping is overdone on this example, it can actually be softened further through the use of various layers of dust and additional washes to blend it in more. Having said that, in the field, there are many examples of serious weathering, including significant chipping. When applying the chipping, be sure to use an ultra fine brush. As usual, it's better to go over an area again than to repaint any mistakes. Dark rust is used here, but some people prefer to use other colors such as black or dark gray. The most important thing to keep in mind is that it needs to be random. Random, but also logical. So for example, so for example, try and imagine where the scratches would occur and how. The edges are always a given, but rarely does the scratch extend the full length of the edge. So keep it to patches. Consider where the crew would walk on the tank, and especially on the turret. One other thing to consider when applying the chipping is scratch one, scratch all. By that I mean, keep the whole feel of each side the same. Do not favour any over the other unless you have a specific reason or intention in mind. I did not wish to go down the path of heavy mud effects, wanting more of a light mud splashing with a little coverage over the tracks. The first step is to gather three or so colours of pigment that you intend to use. They need to be sufficiently different so as to create a natural variance. A good starting point is to choose the colour that best reflects the colour of the dirt in the area of operation. For instance, desert or sand regions versus dark mud in Europe or Russia. Given that the subject tank is of Russian origin, the primary colour I chose for this build was dark Russian earth. Add a generous amount of the pigment into a small mixing bowl, then add the appropriate thinner, usually the same brand is best, mix it well so that its consistency is that of toothpaste, then with an old brush apply the paste to the model in small controlled amounts. Another method is to add some pigment paste to the front or back edge and then spray it with an empty airbrush to create some splatter effects. This can also be done directly off the brush. The higher the pressure set, the further and greater the splatter effects will occur. Also, the wetness of the pigment paste will contribute to the equation. For instance, if it's more runny, obviously, it will splatter more. As with all weathering, make sure you keep a consistent finish throughout the whole subject. Once you have done a section, and before the area has had a chance to dry, sprinkle small amounts of the other two lighter pigments onto the surface in a random pattern.
That's all for this episode of Scale Model Cinema. I hope you enjoyed it and will join us again in the future. Check out other videos at scalemodelcinema.com or like us on Facebook. Cheers.